Good morning, Revolution, everybody, and welcome to our show this Friday morning in the end of January in the year of somebody's Lord, <laughs> 2022. Good morning, uh, Scott, Rosanna, Michael, and Anita. Good morning. Good morning, Good morning, Revolution. Good morning, Revolution. Good well, morning, Red Bull got... electoral change. Oh, wait, that's the wrong one. <laughs> <laughs> Come again, Scott. What did you I say? Said, Good morning, gradual electoral change. Oh, wait, that's the wrong one. <laughs> no, no, no. It's it, it, quantity turns into quality or something like Hopefully. that. Hopefully. You know, there's quantitative development, then there's that's a big, right. big bang, big bang, Marxist, Leninist, <laughs> communist theory. So, um, got a lot to talk about this week. Uh, your homeboy is sending troops uh, to Europe. What's up with, uh, I mean, well, I mean, like an election ploy or what? The, you know, U.S. troops have been in Europe for a long time, um, never left after World War II. Uh, but yeah, I guess it kind of, it's kind of mind boggling to me how anybody thinks we have any business, uh, you know, deciding what happens in Ukraine. I think it would be like if, you know, China and Russia decided that uh, our the our inhuman border policy and the, the crisis on our southern border was a, a threat to the stability of the region and sent a bunch of troops um, along with you know um, other countries and, and massed them on our border with with Me mass them in Mexico on our border like that's what's happening in Ukraine right now we are sending troops to the border of another, it, I don't know, it just, it, I'm constantly kind of in shock at how anybody could think that was a, a good idea, except of course, the people that make money off of it, the, the, the ruling class. Wait a minute, now you mean China or Russia? There's, there's no China, Russia country, I mean. You, you know, China, China. China. Well, I'm thinking if there were a, a counter, I know, I a know, counterweight I know. to NATO, it would probably include China and Russia, you know, the, like the BRICS or whatever. Yeah, some people approach it like, you know, this was before the collapse of the Soviet Union, and, and, and it's not. I mean, they don't have, China's one thing and Russia is another. Um, but it's, uh, what's the reason for it, Rosan? I mean, you know, what, and, and how are the military families organization and that you're, in, what do they think about sending troops over there? Well, I, I think it's a mixed bag in, in many ways, but it's but one thing for sure is is the the dread that we, your your child will be sent over there, and the dread that uh, they'll be caught in some kind of fire, and end up dead, and you know you have the military coming at your door to knock. It's something that people don't really understand unless you're you you've lived it. Um, and, and so whether you're for it or you're not for it, you still have that. That's the first thing that pops in your mind, uh, your child being in danger. Um, I think the, you know, this whole NATO thing, it, it's probably an exercise in, in, you know, egoism. And, but more than anything, it's, it's trying to, uh, once again, the profits of the military industrial complex, more and yes. more money. And it's just, that's the bottom line. And I really urge people to read thoroughly, you know, the arguments on both sides so that they can make a much better decision as to what they're gonna support and what they're not gonna support. Because at the end of the day, it's our tax money that's being spent, our tax money. And that's, I think also really important. That's how we are all connected to this. Uh, Anita, wait, Michael, why is why is Putin so why are the Russians so upset? Well, you know, my understanding is that when the Soviet Union collapsed, there was a time in the 90s and early 2000s when Russia wanted to be part of NATO, you know, economically, militarily, and they were rejected. And so if you go back in time to the you know 40s, 50s, 60s, the, the Warsaw Pact, you know, the, the Eastern Bloc was you know, in conflict with the Western Bloc, with 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 NATO, and NATO was created to um, kind of block the quote unquote domino effect. And so, there's really no need for it to exist anymore, right? 
And so I think there's that we have to remember that NATO, it's, it, it's an illegal entity. It shouldn't exist anymore, right? And then you also have the fact that Putin and the, the now capitalist Russia was rejected from that alliance and, you know, the, the economic um, uh, implications that would go along with it. And so I think that's what's, what people are kind of upset about. I agree with Rosanna that there's a lot of ego there. I think Biden has this kind of, oh, I can be harder on China and Russia. That was clear in the debates that he had with Trump a couple of years ago, at least in my opinion. And so um, I think we have to be careful there. And I do think we have to differentiate between Russia and China. But there's also um, um, uh, tension in Taiwan, too. I understand there's um, troops or at least training of troops going on in Taiwan, which was in the news. Let's stick to Russia. (laughs) Yeah. But was there ever a reason for NATO to exist, Anita? I mean... I'm not, I don't want to go into the history of NATO, but but right now I think we have to really look at NATO as kind of a an organization whose goals have crept into just protecting Western ruling class uh, um, economic interests from any uh, competition with Russia. And I think we have to look at this um, Nord Stream 2 pipeline that is really pissing off the United States. That is going to be a big, uh, you know, a big benefit to, to Germany to get uh, Russian uh, natural gas, uh, and um, and and Ukraine is angry about it because they're going to lose out on some transit fees for um, gas going through their uh, their territory. So I think I think we have to look at the material interests and who's who's going to benefit from this and and who's not. I think that's a really important point, you know, um, that the economic uh, imperatives, capitalist, imperialist imperatives are driving uh, U.S. and other, uh, but but Germany doesn't seem to be so interested in it. So that's another side of the, uh, they're like, I w- <laughs> they said they were going to send a thousand, two thousand uh, uh, helmets to mm-hmm. <laughs> and so the, the the mayor, I read this morning, the mayor of Kiev said, what are they going to do next? Send 2,000 pillows? <laughs> <laughs> but the NATO never had a reason to exist, except for the attempt of the United States and Europe to push back socialism. They wanted markets. They wanted access to those, and that hasn't changed, no, uh, Scott. That's true. Yeah, and remember that one of NATO's first uh, actions in Europe was um, an undercover operation in Italy to prevent communists from winning a majority in the parliament, um, prevent the Communist Party. Um, so NATO has always been an anti-communist organization, and and true to form, it has always been allied with the extreme right. It's played a, a key role in building up extreme right and fascist movements uh, in Eastern Europe. And, you know, it's not just a, a, a slogan to say we can't have democracy here and and oppose it abroad. It, like the the drive toward militarism, the, the, this, this push against Russia is going to end up strengthening the extreme right and strengthening the fascist forces here. Plus, it's just insulting, right, that um, to hear the president over and over again throughout his term talk about, oh, you know, I want to do this. I have these great goals. My hands are tied, though. Uh, Republicans won't go along with me. My hands are, I've done what I can. My hands are tied. Uh, And then, you know, talking tough about being able to bring peace and stability and democracy to Europe. Like, you can't even, you know, arrange an effective fight against the, the COVID pandemic here. So, you know, step back. $500 $500 million, the uh, Speaker of the House, under the directives of, I imagine, the President, they sent to Ukraine, and, and yet they can't support uh, the kinds of uh, monies for children. What is that tax credit thing? Child tax credit. Child tax credit. They can't get the bill passed. What about the water in Flint? <laughs> uh, what about water in Flint, you know? Mm-hmm. I'm glad you raised the issue of democracy at, at home because some people say that Russia is an autocracy. Is that true? Anybody? Is Russia an autocracy? What does that mean? Well, I mean, I asked the question, if Russia is an autocracy, and I ain't no fan of Putin, don't get me wrong, what is the United States? 
The Russians got, there are 51 or 57, I forget the number, uh, representatives of the Communist Party of the Russian Federation in the Duma. I think they call it the Duma, don't they? Yep, yep, the, yep. How many communists are in the party, the Congress of the United States? Well, according to the Republican Party, you got 50 because all the <laughs> Democrats, <laughs> Rosanna, all the Democrats are communists. But if you I measure wish. democracy <laughs> by the number of working class representatives in the government, who is more democratic? Yeah. Not Michael. even people of color are. Well, I think, and I think they have a few other parties also represented. I think there's, you know, there's like social democratic groups, other conservative groups, and so it's just more. There's more representation, as as Rosanna was saying. Yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, there's repression. They re they raided the offices of the communists there recently, and there's suppression of freedom of speech, so called. Um, and that kind of, but we got the same kind of thing here. I mean, you know, in different ways. So, I mean, before we go around beating our chests about democracy in the United States, we have to take a look and in what does democracy consist? I mean, actually meaningful, significant mm -hmm. uh, uh, democracy. Speaking of which, to shift the gears a little bit, Supreme Court, Brea is uh, retiring. Did anybody watch his speech? I heard it was a good speech. No. No. <laughs> no, I nobody didn't. watched it? No. What kind of- uh, Which one is Breyer? Is he the old white guy? <laughs> <laughs> I ain't got nothing against there being either old or white, but you know, they need some younger forces up off in there. Um, anyway, he's one of the more liberal uh, justices and mm -hmm. Mr. Biden promised to uh, nominate an African American woman, which would be a wonderful mm -hmm. thing. And uh, there are three, uh, at least three uh, con contenders. Right. Um, and that's a good thing, right? I mean, we support that. Absolutely. I think there's going to be a lot of, you know, we're going to see another round of, of the very usual criticism um, from from some some sectors about oh this is just representation whatever this is just uh identity politics was the old word now people tend to say representation or demographic representation um which i think i think you know sort of dismiss the uh the importance of appointing a, a black woman to the supreme court i think that's misguided i think it, it misunderstands what the fight is about because it's not about representation. It's about political equality, which isn't just the right to vote. It's also the right for oppressed people to participate in making and interpreting and enforcing laws on the whole of society. And that is what white supremacy in the United States cannot tolerate. And you saw it nakedly and openly in the Trump regime, all of those attacks on any woman, on any person of color who, uh, dared to you know hold or exercise political power so this is a real fight it's a real struggle um of course the ruling class tries to take it and and disfigure it turn it into just a question of representation but but this is a fight for equality and democracy and and this is a good step well you're, you're right i mean representation um is representation is a step but it's not mm -hmm. the whole it's not the anything. Whole. Anything's better than another Brad Kavanaugh. Well, I mean, you can, have, you can have you can have Clarence Thomas on the Supreme Court, that, but his <laughs> politics are exactly. he's going to represent the people. The question is, does the representation represent? <laughs> right. Isn't that the issue? I you like know? that. Does the representation represent? Actually, so, represent. so but the Supreme Court needs to be. They're talking about remodeling it, enlarging it. Does the Communist Party support that? Uh, I do, uh, uh, Rosanna. I sure do. Okay. I, think, I don't. I don't think there should be lifers either. It's mm. just so term limits. Yeah. It's, yeah. These they have to have some kind of term limits. I don't see how that is represented. And the other thing is, everyone and everyone already knows who's going to vote in which direction. How is that being uh, uh, partial? What is it impartial to? 
right. to the issue. But that, that just doesn't make any sense to me. But I think this, this opportunity to get a rep, uh, someone that represent, that really represents is great, but it also raises the stakes in terms of the election this, this year, the 2022 elections. Now, now the stakes are now. even higher. You better get ready. It's going to be, mm -hmm. it's, gonna, it's a really important fight. It's a really, really, really important fight. Uh, but they say that, you know, with regard to term limits, that if you stay there a long time, that your judicial reasoning, like wine, improves with age. <laughs> Anita? I wouldn't have wanted to see Ruth Bader Ginsburg step down for, uh, you know, term limit reasons, but but I am also really excited about the, the prospect of having, uh, especially this front runner seems to be this Judge uh, Jackson, who was the one who famously said, presidents are not kings. Mm. Um, and um, and she, she really, and she used to be a public defender. So I think that, you know, and she was also con confirmed by the Senate just last year with 53 votes. So three Republicans voted for her. So I think she would just like be a shoe in. But it will be interesting, the optics of future decisions when there's three liberal justices and they're all women, and then, uh, you know, the rest uh, uh, are all men uh, the, taking the conservative side. So that will be, I'm sure we'll see some of those decisions in the future. Reactionaries, reaction. You know, just to change the subject a little bit, you reminded me, Michael told me yesterday that the communists in Chile who won a big election in a, in a coalition with a broader you know array of political forces that they now identify themselves as as communistas feministas and all of their literature all of the people in the government communist feminists isn't that something should we do that yes. huh? i think we have to i mean i, I think we have to be fighters against male supremacy and misogyny um you know, regardless of what we call ourselves, um, the 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 reality is that um, it it hurts when it's allowed to persist. It hurts our party. It hurts the movement, and it hurts the working class. And it has All no right. place. We need a lightning round on this issue. Uh, next, uh, Anita, should we call ourselves communist feminists? Well, I think we we should, but we maybe ought to um, highlight our fight against white supremacy as well in our, in our name which would okay. be harder to uh, do. Michael? I've always, I'm going to say no, just because I've always considered myself to be anti-misogyny, uh, anti-sexist as, as a communist, you know, so. Rosanna? Communist, yeah. Communist, uh, no, I don't, I don't see how the working class overall would understand that personally. So I don't, I don't think that's a good term. I, not in the United States, in Chile, perhaps. You know, they feel that that's their, it's the it's a correct term, but here in the U.S., I don't think so. It works there. Democratic, communist, anti-racist, anti-sexist. Anti I there was just one uh, word for all of it, like communist. Communist. <laughs> that's it. I say yes. Let's let's do it. Why not? You know, do something <laughs> different. Shake things up a little bit, and uh, it'll it'll create a discussion. I tell you that it'll create it'll create a and the communists in, 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 in Chile are bold like that. And that's what we gotta be bold, you know? Cause it had, what did Breck say about boldness? He says, it's got magic in it, you know? And that's, uh, and, that, and, and that's the kind of magic that we need. Now, I know y'all gonna say, hey, what about dialectical materialism? Don't be going into no magical thinking. Uh, but sometimes you need a little bit of magic to get you through the day, huh? Who was, okay, question of the week. Let's see, uh, I think it had to do with uh, our position on LGBTQ rights. And I wanna, I wanna start it off by asking Michael a question because we got a question last week, which I didn't get to. And that question is why do we have transgender on our application form it, and is that, couldn't that be a way of discriminating and identifying uh, people who have transgender identity? Michael? I would say no, actually it, it was um, asked to be put on the application form by many of our transgender uh, comrades so that when we 
um, interact with these comrades and when we um, mail things to them or interact with them, whether it be by email, telephone, whatever, we use the correct pronouns, we understand where they're coming from a little bit more. And it's about representation because even within the ranks of the Communist Party, representation does matter. You know, we represent the working class and all of its aspects. You know, we're black, brown, yellow, red, you know, gay, straight, you know. And as someone on uh, that side of the rainbow, I can say, you know, in terms of our position on the LGBTQ rights, I think we've moved in the correct direction over the past 20 years or so. Uh, most recently with a statement that we put out um, in solidarity with the transgender community, uh, which you can find on cpusa.org. Um, and we also did coverage of it in the people's world as well. They called it historic development and, and the struggle for LGBTQ rights in, in the Communist Party. Okay, now, so what, so the other question for this week is what is our party's thoughts? And you talked about a correct, direct, what is that co correct direction, Anita? Well, that we're, we, we do support um, equality um, on all levels. Uh, we, we recognize that discrimination against the LGBTQ community is a, a, a way that the ruling class divides the working class and sets it against itself, which really hurts both sides. So, um, so I think we're just, we're, we're firmly in that, um, that uh, side. Uh, and we have a brand new leaflet that's just come out in the last couple of months that has a, a really in-depth article about the Communist Party's involvement with the LGBTQ uh, struggle over the years. And and the, uh, a little focus on the legislation that's right now being used by the GOP to um, to you know discriminate against trans and LGBTQ uh, citizens. I want to ask a theoretical question. Now we know that uh, sexism is not uh, a uh, product of uh, development exclusive to capitalism, right? It predated capitalism uh, with the overthrow of mother right uh, historically. Uh, homophobia, uh, is that also the case with respect to uh, discrimination against uh, uh, people of different sexual orientations? And uh, which is exacerbated under capitalism, but it's not necessarily a condition of capitalism. Is that true, anybody? I would say yes. Uh, it is. Um, certainly homophobia uh, existed um, in, in various uh, ways, though perhaps not always as uniformly and, and aggressively as, as we'd expect. You know, a, a lot of historical research has brought to light that in, you know, the early Christian church, for example, um, uh, the um, the, the homophobia that we see in a lot of modern Christianity, um, especially on the, the conservative side, was not, um, was not present, was not uniform. Um, but yeah, homophobia, like sexism, like misogyny, predates capitalism. But in a certain sense, right now what we have is capitalist homophobia, like we have capitalist male supremacy and um, White supremacy and capitalism are a slightly different relation, but but all of the forms of oppression that are that are imported kind of into capitalism are restructured and deployed by the capitalist class for their for their benefit. So the homophobia that we see now is not um, the same historically materially as it was um, in, in pre capitalist society. Can I add something. Go ahead, please. I, I think um, there, there's also pre-capitalist acceptance and equality. Um, I know in, in anthropological studies of hunting and gathering societies, um, homosexual behavior is just overlooked as just, you know, not, not something worth uh, noticing really. Uh, so, so there is in some societies acceptance and subcultures acceptance of that kind of diversity without a second thought. But in this society, and in this society, it means that there is a fundamental need to incorporate and champion uh, anti-discrimination against LGBTQ as a fundamental part of the fight for democracy, up to and including and after socialism because of its deep incubation in the social psychology 
of the broader public, including the working class. Isn't that true? Yeah, I was uh, yeah. The, the socialist countries our communist parties that are in power will tell you that there's an ongoing struggle against misogyny, homophobia, transphobia happening in their like the Cubans often talk about that Mariela Castro who's Raul's daughter, she's kind of like leading the struggle against that in Cuba. And so to assume that, you know, biblical or um, ancient, you know, homophobia, transphobia is the same as feudal homophobia, transphobia, capitalists, and then, you know, under socialists, it's not going to be the same, but it's still there. It's something that's ingrained in us and we have to continue struggling against it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And thinking well, of the I other part of the question was does it for us, huh? Somebody else. The other part of the it? question was what would we do if we were in power? Um, and one of the concrete things looking to Cuba is like they have universal health care, and part of that is um, gender affirming surgery. Um, so that that is you know a very uh, concrete step that they have taken uh, toward um, you know in the fight against transphobia, and that's something that would be great to see here. Both universal health care and you know, um, guaranteed access to gender affirming surgery for people who want it. What about affirmative action? Taking special measures to represent uh, and, um, and making sure that, that that is a basic part of any uh, collective or representative or decision-making body. That's another issue which uh, one has to take up as a basic part of the struggle for uh, democracy. Uh, now and in the future, uh, for the foreseeable future. So um, until the state withers away, and, you know, um, and that, you know, might be three, four, five hundred years, hopefully not that long, but <laughs> this shit is deep. Okay. Anything coming up? Shows, programs, Michael? No, there is, there is a uh, writing abolition uh, group uh, taking place tonight uh, through the Michigan district, but it's anyone can attend. It's on uh, the website, cpusa.org. So if you're interested in um, the struggle to abolish prisons and standing in solidarity with our incarcerated people, um, being in contact with them, writing to them as a pen pal and so forth, you can attend. I believe it's at 7 p.m. tonight, and you can find the link again on cpusa.org. All right, you got the last word. Stay strong, stay safe, stay in the fight. Have a great weekend, everybody. Take care. Bye. Bye. Oh my God, you know what?